Okay, so uh, hello and welcome here in Impact Building of uh, Faculty of Mathematics and Physics or MATFIS uh, of Charles University in Prague. And uh, I would like to welcome all of you here and also all watching the stream. And also I'd like to welcome our distinguished guests and also uh, Karel and uh, Radek from the uh, Zygmunt branch of uh, .NET team uh, that are helping me to uh, organize this event. And I will now directly give a word to uh, Karel. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone, uh, as we have announced and welcome as well online people. Uh, I'm not sure where the camera is, probably over somewhere over there. Uh, we're very happy to see you here and I'm just gonna briefly walk you for what we're gonna deal with today. And uh, I don't think the clicker works. Like, it does not. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna use the computer, doesn't matter. So first of all, a uh, big thanks actually to Pavel Ježek over here from uh, Matfis at Charles University for helping us to organize this over here, booking and like supporting us from that. This is community event, by the way, it has nothing to do uh, with the companies that we're working for or not working for. Um, he mentioned me and Radek, we share the same last name. Uh, he's on my team, but otherwise we're not related. Just FYI, we're on the .NET team, actually networking team. And uh, this is our kind of side job or not job even. This is just like community work. And uh, I would like to actually big thanks to Tomasz Hertzek uh, from Update Conference because the four speakers you will be, uh, you know, you're gonna hear today, they are our international speakers. They are flown, flown here for the Update Conference. I think actually all four of them have talks tomorrow. So, um, you know, Riganti Update Conference, Tomasz Hertzek, thank you very much for having us here. And uh, the big thanks as well will go to obviously to our speakers. So. Uh, hopefully you saw the agenda. We're going to have Brown and uh, Zandi from Australia, from Brisbane. I didn't mess it up this time, hopefully. Uh, we're going to have Konrad Kokosa from Poland, uh, Purnima Nayar from UK, and Kevin Gossi. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. Goss uh, from France. Um, so we're going to hear from them. Hopefully you're going to like that. Uh, and that's actually the next thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, I'm going to pretty, pretty, pretty please to take a picture of this right now, ideally. I'm going to put it in your face a couple of times. No matter if you're here or if you're watching online or if you're watching recording, please take a picture. There's a survey and we would really love to hear from you. Even if you hate this, even if you just watch it five minutes from recording, uh, it will help us to tell, you know, if you tell us like what you didn't like, what didn't catch your eye, uh, how you learned about the event and that stuff. So please uh, do it. It's going to help us to do better things in future. And with that, uh, we will give word to Brauna. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Bronwyn, and maybe by my accent, you may have guessed. It as well, I am from Australia. Uh, so I speak, you know, Australians, we speak a lot of languages. We uh, have Australian, and um, that's about it. So the also unique thing about Australians is we do like to use a lot of slang, and I'm in a very different time zone to normal. So please um, put up your hand if I start making no sense and using Australian slang and let me know so I can that for you. Even people that I've known for 10 years, I teach them new words and phrases every time I say uh, So tonight <clears throat> I wanted to tell you a few stories um, and reflecting on a few projects that I've worked on over the years. Uh, I've been doing this for longer than I haven't, uh, which pretty much just makes me old. In that time, I've um, delivered lots of projects and then I've had a lot of projects fail. 
I tend to like to work on short, sharp projects. So that means in all that time, it adds up to lots of different combinations. Sick it as a That's okay. A lot of the time when we're looking at projects, a lot of us will stress out about, you know, what language should we be using, what architecture, what is the latest pattern, what's, you know, what should I be doing on this project that's going to make it a success? And in all that time, I have never seen a project fail due to the technology change. Pretty much, I can guarantee you every project that I've seen fail has come down to communication factors. Communication is really, really hard. Um, I think one of these, this sort of diagram here, I think really sort of highlights problems that you have when you're communicating with different. The, so if we look at the top one there, we've got a, a, a swing with uh, three different levels and three different colors, and that's that's how marketing thought coming in. It, it passed along to the sales guys, and they decided it was a swing with three wires rather than three different three different phases. <laughs> okay, technology doesn't fail ever. Um, once you send it along to the engineer, they decided that the swing needed to be tied on the tree sideways rather than the branch. And then down here, when they manufactured it, they put it across two branches, no longer swinging. And then the crew modified it because it needed to swing, so they cut the middle out of the tree. And what the customer really wanted was just a tire over the branch on the tree. We see this a lot in, in projects where when people are not on the same page, what you ask for and what you get it end up being very, very different. What I wanted to talk to you about was a couple of patterns I've seen over the years of where things can go well or can go bad and how you can sort of identify them. One of the biggest ones I usually see is when people haven't had an actual conversation. This one I usually highlight as You've seen a few, there's been a bunch of emails go backwards and forwards, or there's a bunch of Slack messages or Teams messages, people going backwards and forwards in asynchronous communication, and we're getting nowhere. We're going around in circles. Uh, there's people that are getting upset because conveying emotion and sarcasm or happiness in these mediums, people read the wrong things into it. And basically, the easiest way to fix this one is actually have a real conversation. Um, don't be afraid to let you know the phones that we're all, you know got in our hands there to pick them up and actually make that phone call, or to you know sit down and have a face to face with someone, or have a video chat or a video call. Because as soon as you can have a one on one and have that tonality conversation, it's amazing the, the problems that you fix in a in a two minute call versus a three week long email like that's been bouncing backwards and forwards. If you've ever been on a, any sort of project and you're offered a site visit, I've never ever come out of a site visit that has not given me something that I would never have been able to see if I hadn't been there. A lot of the times you'll turn up and a user will, will think they've told you everything that they do in their job, and they'll tell you what they think their process is. But when you sit there in the site visit, and they think they've got everything. You, you notice these little things, like they'll have a little post-it note. A lot of the times it'll be their password. Uh, sometimes there's a little cheat, cheat sheet on the, on the post-it note, or you'll find these amazing little spreadsheets that are off to the side of the system that they use that is completely off book and it's a completely different process that you haven't even got in the process flow that you're going to do. So to sit there and look at those site visits, you can learn so much from a user and see what they actually do in their current job, as opposed to what they tell you. Second part of that is just sometimes to observe. 
And sometimes that means not actually saying anything, just sit back and, and look at what they're doing. So there's lots of really important parts to, to watching a user. So it could be what environment do they have to use your system in? Are they using it indoors? Are they using it in good lighting? Is it outside and they can't see the screen? Um, what sort of size uh, like uh, devices are they using? Are they using something that needs to be ruggedized? Are they using something that needs to work in a safe environment that has to be electrical safe? Uh, how, how often do they have to be able to charge the device? Um, how close are they to PowerPoints? I've seen a few different projects where uh, they tried to improve a process by adding a system to it, but the problem was is that it kept running out of charge too quickly. So, you know, they would wheel it over and plug it in and do a few things, but what that meant was it interrupted the flow and they'd make extra errors because they'd have to go back and forth. There was a project I did quite a few years ago where we started to optimize um, a customer interaction with a with a like a service desk, uh, and then once we watched them, we noticed that they went back and forth to this printer like multiple times in this conversation with the client, and it was taking them a really long time because what what they'd done was they decided to centralize all the printing. Let's forget the whole fact that it's a big waste of paper to print this thing, stuff out all the time. But they were going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And they were having problems where they were mixing up documents because everyone's printing and they're trying to gather it and go back to the client and get them to sign things. And in the end, what it was easier to do was them to go out and buy a really cheap printer and put it right next to the desk so that they could get some of that stuff over the line really quickly. Um, this was well before we had um, electronic signatures and DocuSigns and stuff like that. But without having watched those users and seen the difference that that made to their day and how much it was adding to their process, you would never have been able to see that. Definitely a skill that um, is very useful for a lot of these projects is to ultimately be curious. Keep asking why until you understand the fundamental of what they're trying to do. If you take a system that they've already got or a process that they've already got and do a copy paste, a lift and shift, without understanding fundamentally why that do that thing, a lot of the time you're building in excess work. Take the opportunity to work out why, why they do it that way. A lot of the time they won't even know. Um, I've had quite a few users, like they have a giant spreadsheet. They'll go through a 20 to 30 step process and you're trying to work out why they do this step in the middle. And it's like, well, that's what I was taught from the person that had the job before me. And if you're trying to replicate that into a new system, you're just building in a useless redundant step. So getting to the bottom of why it's important. Is it, is it a rule that the business has? Is it a government policy? Is, do they have to do it for a particular reason? Like, do you have to gather this information? Do you have to store it? Can we do it a different way? And sometimes it's nice to just ask them to step back from what they currently do and think about if they could reimagine it from scratch, how they could get to the end easier and what would be efficient for them if they didn't have to do the thing that they're chained to at the moment. On a lot of the projects, uh, we, we quite often get challenged between picking in this triangle of time versus cost versus quality. I don't know about you, but one of the hardest things I found when I first started doing a lot of development was I wanted everything to be perfect. I wanted the code to be neat. I wanted it to be efficient. I wanted it to be fast. I wanted the UI to look good. I wanted the, the queries to run quickly. I wanted the users to be happy. The problem with that is the more time you spend, the more money it costs. And to make it work better, like you have to make sure the quality's there. 
and I found that as a developer, it was never quite perfect. I always thought there was another little refactor I could do. There was another little tweak to the code. I could add another test. I could always make that UI look better. Sometimes you just have to go with the flow and do the best that you can in the time that you have and get used to the fact that it's never, ever going to be perfect. And even if you ship it at what you think is going to be perfect, what the user then decides when they start using it, it's no longer fit for purpose. So to balance that triangle out, there's always compromises. And each project can be different. Some of them you can't afford to to dip on quality. Some of them you have a fixed cost and some of them you have a fixed time and you have to work out which ones are gonna let you manipulate to make the project a success. A lot of times in these types of projects, what I found is people get paralyzed by the choices. You're trying to pick between a couple of different architectures um, or you might have three different options um, that you think could work. And sometimes you just have to pick one. Or uh, what I've seen work really well sometimes is to pick multiple. So if there's three different ideas, let's give all of them a go and see how they turn out and then make another choice later on. Don't get bogged down into, is it should be this particular framework? Is, is this algorithm gonna work faster? and keep second guessing yourself. Give it a go early on and work out if you want to go with one or try all of them to start with. Following on from that, to be able to pick things and move forward, the next one is to be able to actually ship. Uh, a lot of people will get hung up on trying to get that first release out the door. Uh, generally, something is better than nothing. So looking at your minimum viable product and having the bare minimum that you can get users using the system, gathering feedback, seeing if they're going to use it, what parts are working. It doesn't matter that sometimes in the background there's a bunch of sticky tape holding it all together. You might have a form that to the user looks really fancy and then just sends an email that someone does a manual process to. As long as you can gather the data uh, and work out what the, if, if this is a viable thing and to see if there's something, the next bit that you want to work on, what's your next bottleneck, what's going to give you the next, the next boost. A lot of the times we'll get hung up on, I've seen a lot of projects where we want to keep adding features and adding features. It's not quite there yet and we keep finding bugs and we delay that ship date to the point that we never ever release them and it's just too late. So don't be afraid to ship early and then fix, fix as you go and, and learn your lessons. And on failure, failure is not always bad. So a lot of the times we'll do a little experiment. We'll, we'll do lots of experiments with products. We'll do experiments with different technologies. We'll do things with different algorithms. And after we use them for a little bit, we'll find out that they just don't work. And that's not a bad thing. Learning that it's not the appropriate technology, learning that that algorithm didn't actually give us the, the boost that we wanted, learning that that UI change that we made, actually, it made the users not like the system. These are really, really important as long as we learn from them. So, like, doing those quick experiments, trying, trying those three things and failing sometimes is more valuable than not learning from it and keep going with the same mistake and learning, like, three years later that your product is useless. Uh, not everyone gets to work on greenfield code bases. Uh, have any of you worked on anyone else's code in any of your projects? Yeah. Yep. Most developers, when we pick up someone else's code, the first thing we want to do is rewrite it. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the times we'll criticize, like, why did they do this? 
Why did they do this really bizarre framework? Why did they go and write this thing that already exists? Uh, what I learned over the years, having been the person that has to come back to my own code sometimes, is that you aren't in that person's shoes at the time that they had to walk it. Uh, when you're on projects, sometimes they put some really bizarre constraints on you. Like I've been on projects where they've decided that you can't use a whole segment of a framework for some reason, it was their rule. And us developers, you know, we're kind of creative, so we'll go and write something that's equivalent when it was already there because they didn't say we couldn't write the equivalent thing, we just couldn't use the thing. And when you come back and look at that code and it's like, makes no sense why these people were doing it this way. Or it's the first time they, they were using it, or it was a new framework, or it was a beta, and they were learning, so they made mistakes. The code isn't perfect at the time. It's really easy to criticize. Uh, but if you haven't, you, if you weren't on that project when they were building it with the team then, what? <clears throat> If you haven't walked in their shoes, it's really hard to criticize. And if you can learn to move on from that. So if you can use that code and leave it as it is and work around it and improve it in bits and pieces. <laughs> you'll get a much better system because you'll be able to build on it without having to start from scratch every single time. And I think one of the most important things um, over your journey as being a developer is to love lifelong learning. Whatever you've learned so far today, all the languages, all the frameworks, they'll be out of date in five years time. The stuff that I learned a very long time ago, most of those like no one uses anymore. The foundation was there. And to be curious and wanting to give, uh, give everything a go. So when you're on a new project, there's always going to be something, a new framework, a different language. It might be a different way of doing something. If people aren't willing to give it a go, that's when the, that's when the projects tend to, tend to fail. So if someone's like suggesting something a little bit different for you, um, always try and give it a go, even for a little while. Give it a go, see how it works, and come back over the top of it. And if, you, if you're on a project and you're the one that likes to learn, likes to try new things, wants to try a different framework, give things a go, you end up um, a lot but better skill base, but also people want to work. Because you're not the, the person that's set in their ways and only wants to do things one way. And I've worked with pro on projects with people that have essentially been like developers their whole life. And what it's meant for them is that they continually learning and they haven't had to like move up the track and into management because they keep wanting to learn frameworks. And I'm going to lose my voice. Uh, has anyone got any questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, I know it was hard for you, a uh, bit jet lag, and hopefully you don't lose your voice for tomorrow's talk. Thank you, Veronan, very much. Uh, and in uh, just a minute, we're going to switch to uh, Conrad's talk. So give us a few seconds, or I mean a minute.
I start? Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Konrad. I'm super glad that we are here and I'm here too. Uh, because I would like to tell you a few and the thoughts that I wish I heard years ago when I was also finishing studies. And, uh, so, in general, this is a talk why crazy ideas pay off. Small survey for you. Uh, how many of you have a blog, social media, do some, maybe contribute to anything that seems to be kind of activity in the field of the program? Almost awesome. So it is a talk for you. Uh, why crazy ideas? My story is pretty boring. That I I finished uh, Warsaw University of Technology, Poland, uh, Information Technology. I was super interested in science. I was I seriously become nerd. So uh, learning uh, programming and everything like that. Then I started my first job, the second job, and so on and so on, and it ended like that. No energy. Uh, out of the sudden, me, a guy that loved computer and programming, could get computer. I was bored. I was absolutely no interested in anything. I missed that the jQuery has been created. Hard because everyone is using it, but still, I missed that because I was not following anything. I was just going for my job, returning from my and super happy it was Friday. So. I Guys, before without computer, and then I dis discovered that it is a classical burnout. That I was over, over uh, fascinated with computers somehow, and in the end, uh, when I started to work in a regular job, anyone has a regular full day job already. Head of this. So, uh, I hope that what I will say will uh, help you avoid that. So, in general, burnout is pretty. Uh, it is very popular. Everyone is talking about how you can avoid what it is, are written, and so on. And the same, I was. I realized I have it, and uh, luckily, it ended. I was. I will. I would be there here now if the burnout continued. Of I'm here, and it all happened because of died. Uh, oh, do you know? Died? Some of you, you know, it is not only for copy pasting code. It is all things. I love it, and it was super game changer for me. It helped me to overcome burnout. How? But I started to think how it happened. I was nerd. I was just living with computers. Anyone? Or too young. It's probably in with this game ever. Uh, this is Riverside, one of the games on Atari, the old 8 bit computer. I was playing games a lot. This is the Sim City 2000, and I was playing hundreds of games, probably gaming computers, learning how to written five. Then was university studying, and I was playing games also. University, I only changed the kind of the internet has been created at the time. I mean, popularized at the times. I was playing. I changed the type of games. This text-based code. Um, I probably no one of you passion to game like that, but. It's Interactive text based multiplayer game that we were playing and time and so on. I spent probably too much hours that at university, but still I was also learning something. Uh, I was still interested in science and the and then the problem says this discrepancy between passion and the fact that I earned money, it was super nice because I earned money. For time, buy something, and in general, if you, oh, in computer science, we have good salaries. 
having this. But it may lead to burn really, because your passion becomes your job. And then there is this that you start to lose. And uh, after we investigating all the stuff and reading a lot of it and so on, I created my own that explains what happened. And there is this pretty popular curve after we have created Leonard in the book that explains how we learn things, skills that we gathered. It is not a linear process. We are having some peaks, we have some ups, downs, and so on. And this book, by the way, the author of theory that master something you have to learn 10,000 hours. Uh, this is the one, but I was concentrating on this master curve, and this is what happened, I believe. Because, you know, you have your childhood, your learning, studying, and you are just gathering, your fascination is growing, and then everything drops, you start to trip drop. And then the question is for you, what you, how you will achieve it? Do you are, do you are even aware of the fact that it will happen. For me, I was not aware. It just happened that I discovered I have a burnout and also someone told me that Stack Overflow is not a place in code. But you can also answer those questions that I And uh, it is super, it is a portal that has a great gamification of the topic uh, of the and a type of site. So you have a reputation, you are gathering points for answering questions, you have badges, uh, you are start to compete with other to, uh, to get more points for your answers. And in the case of .NET, if you know John Skid, possible if he has started to answer I next one. Dance, that was one I, I I started to you know, treat it as a game. But it started also, I, I start to feel the same passion like I like game, playing games and so on. So all those answers, uh, in the end, the reachability of all this. There are many statistics. You are suddenly discovering that you are reaching millions of people that are copy pasting your code to play solutions. It is kind of satisfaction. At least. Right, but uh, so this is uh, that was my breaking point. I discovered it as a something that starts to bring down again to the science. And then other things has followed. So because of this and uh, uh, because of this, and because of Stack Overflow, I, I discovered that I can have some positive impact. I start to learn things to answer questions. I needed to learn something. So as a kind of side effect, I start to discover various frameworks. I start to dig in into the language and so on. So it was a super winning situation. Someone has an answer. I'm learning something. By learning, I started to have a knowledge that I can share. So I start speaking and I started a blog because then I had something to say about. I started and so on and so on. And the thing has uh, Microsoft uh, Aware and Award just having this positive impact and so on. So that was something that I started to think maybe computer science is not is this boring job every day, eight hours, and that's all. And I started to have those crazy ideas. Uh, the very first one was maybe not the, but the, the, the idea was let's create a tour of botnet, botnet rocks like a rock star tour around the country. And we made it. We have created the uh, .netos e mark. Uh, three guys from Poland crashed his firm. Uh, we made a tour around uh, having 
and by day by day, every evening there was a course about programming dot server. It was like a tour. We have rented a car. Unfortunately, sorry, it was a family car. Just we have it beeped. Although the idea was to have it, but okay, at least we have something drive around this country and we spend those five days doing tour. And a lot of people show up. So we thought, okay, so maybe if this, there is interest in such topics, maybe we could create conference. And the conference also succeeded. And then we saw, okay, so if there is interest in these topics, maybe we could have courses. And we made it. And Lukas only knows, Simon, who knows how much hours it spent in such environment trying to record all this uh, course. In the end, what I'm trying to say is that one from idea you will come to another. And all it was, if you will start this machine, probably you will have more and more try to experiment. So uh, will will succeed, some other will not. Another idea, let's create a startup. So now I'm creating a startup because what matters was funny enough. Maybe I decided to do something else. I'm helping in various communities and so on and so on. So for me, the, the, the message is this, uh, this mastery curve is not a single curve. So it is a process. You are building up your curve uh, through time, through lifetime. Uh, and there, there is the question for you. This is something that I will see. Uh, no one told me that weeks or so that I should design it. It's not a kind of a random decisions or luck or whatever. You need to be aware of that and start to think how you can, I don't know, try to avoid actively burnout by various ways, but doing funny stuff is one. It is not the skill, the master curve, but the curve. So the fun curve is like from project to project, from activity to giving yourself some it start having fun again from by project simply stack over for first one day health methods, so on and so on, all the time, having various ideas. Let's write a book. That was one of us, so I done it. I was writing it years, I wrote this book. It paid off me financially, but, but it paid me by building plan. So it allows me to do other stuff. There was a lot of times. At least I have some memes because of that because it's big. It takes two kilograms. It's a thousand pages. So people are measuring, weighting this. Uh, it memes about it. So I have this stuff. Part of .NET community now, so big, at least I, I, I don't know the book uh, ever written. Is not. Uh, and uh, so it is all working, like you are giving talks, you are traveling on board, giving to talks like here in Prague, at the conference, you, it opens you do doors to give workshops, not only in your country, but so it opens for if I will be sitting there and uh, burn out totally, I will be sitting there. Happening. So ideas, let's create a card game. .net. So there is .net. because we don't need to code. Oh, by the way, obviously there was some code. I need code. Still, it is a physical card game about .NET. Let's write a custom .NET because the current tool not good enough. Obviously, let's write it. I made a whole plan how to implement it step by step, from where to start, where I'm going, and uh, I haven't finished it yet. Obviously, hire some topic for a guy. Uh, so I wrote some code. There was experiments. I 
fit many problems, I have segmentation for obviously. Uh, but the goal is here also not always to achieve it, but to start the journey, because while doing it, you will learn new things, you will feel inspiration for other projects. Maybe uh, I was not ever even imagining that this custom .NET garbage collector or be ever used by pro on production by anyone, but still by writing it, I imagined other tools are useful. Do again, just practicing, thinking, various just experiments. So graphics. I made some posters about .NET and and they are hanging on uh, some people are printing it and hanging them on their walls. So okay, no problem. At least another dopamine, hit, another satisfaction, another. A sharing knowledge and all is also give something to people. It is satisfied, but also always to help others. Or maybe you can write a manage runtime, but it's easy to write it simply. So write a man. I started write a manage runtime. It is called manage runtime uh, because it's just a crazy idea. So why not? And uh, obviously, I haven't finished, but again, writing it, I learned another, a lot of other stuff. How you can write low level and manage things in sharp. So, uh, there was all, I haven't had this feeling that I waste anything. So instead of so this is the goal and this is something I really invite you to think what go in and start your job and after a few just hating it. Thing that paying you Vira to Vira, finishing tasks and going home. That's not model that I would like. So call to action for you because okay, I showed some projects, I saw talk, but what you can do. First of all, I'm super inviting you to design your career and try to learn a little. What I'm doing is every year I'm sitting and for one hour I'm drawing literally in chunk paper, I'm drawing a map, what I would like to achieve this year and next year's are the projects that I'm thinking. I'm also coming back to those from previous year. See what I was thinking about two years ago and why most of the haven't succeeded. But still, uh, I'm on top. I'm designing it. I'm trying to think if, uh, what can be achieved, what can, what can I do more for. Uh, so simply try to do it. Uh, and then you need all this stuff in the and just have no sleep because you are involved in so many projects. But at least having some horizon and ideas. Well, where are you going? What are you trying to achieve? What can you help you to and just face? So uh, you can do various things like attending meetups like here or conferences, you read a lot, listen to podcasts. There is a thing, so a, a lot of act, more active activities like talk, you can play on the Stack Overflow answer questions. There you can contribute to the open source that we have a next talk about, contributing to the open source. Hackathons are super nice, especially so they like winning and they will have this satisfaction that they achieved something there. You can speak at meetups, conferences, a lot of things. I speak mentor, maybe just I by some reach it and have a talk or whatever. What is important also that that was my path, right? It's something that was interesting for me. Uh, for speaking at meetups, I found money for doing that, but that doesn't have to be everyone of you. So 
So this applying this curve to your life should be driven by understanding yourself. So another thing that I to encourage you to do is trying to understand. I'm not sure if anyone of you heard of this kind of self-assessment test that really tries to show you what are your strong points. This is one of the examples, one popular one that will just evaluate. You, you are evaluating yourself in this. What drives you? Sometimes we don't know. And after getting this test and this assessment results will show you, like here we have an example of that has significance, futuristic and individualization at the very first, which probably means you should start to dig in into this report and uh, understand all the descriptions that this is probably a person that likes to have an impact on people and knows how to figure out how to put them together, which makes this guy perfect team leader. So maybe it should start to be involved in some communities or open source projects or whatever, because it is something that makes you happy. So I know it is like a psychology thing here that, okay, some tests, I will, but I really believe we should understand ourselves. This will suggest, suggest us to which direction we should go. This test, or this test, other they are. Those two are they suggested by me, but it's some of them paid, some of them are here. Also reading, one of the reading, how do you work, how your brain works, how do you, you should design your life. This is something that no one ever told me at university. It was like, here is a programming, and here is a job, good luck, bye. And no one has told me that I can have some impact, I can I can understand how I should grow my productivity, how I should start to design my whole life, also at work, but maybe personally. Those are super nice books that I've discovered too late. And I really invite you to other any team. Just to practice in how you approach your life. Maybe it sounds bold, or it, but I was really. If someone has told me 10 years ago that I would. Person. So understand yourself and uh, understand your talents, understand what you like to do. Personal brand like that is only. For you, create huge open source project that you will be fighting for years in your basement. But still, if it will make you happy and able to avoid burnout because of that, that's the goal. So experiment A. If you are afraid about okay, so when having time for all this, it is a matter of your product. I'm also regular guy who is not sleeping all the time at least. I'm playing games, I love hitchhiking, I have a family, I'm a Lego I'm doing all the other stuff. And I parad the paradox is that I believe it is even because I have fun for so I design my career to have fun but I have a regular life. That's all. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Conrad. I think it was a very interesting uh, topic that you picked. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I want to actually acknowledge that we have some information here, like some 80 people online. So thank you much for watching online and hopefully as well from recording, even though 
we will see if the recording is available. We actually don't want sure this is the first time in trying, so we will see. Anyway, uh, people online are complaining that the sound is lagging a little bit. I apologize, but right now trying to change that, uh, we might kill the stream entirely, so we will rather not touch it. Uh, yeah, you will have to suffer a little bit. I'm sorry, you know, can't help with that right now more. Uh, anyway, we're gonna get ready for the next talk for Purnima very soon, so enjoy. Hello, uh, thank you for having me here as, as a speaker today. Before I get started, um, a little bit about myself. I'm Purnima Nair. I'm a freelance.NET developer, and I am here to talk at a big conference from where Carol asked me to speak here, and I'm based in UK. I'm a Microsoft MVP for developer technologies, and I'm also an Umbraco MVP. For those who don't know Umbraco, Umbraco is an open source.NET based CMS. Um, non work me, I'm a mother. I have an eight year old daughter. I spend a lot of time with her. Um, I read a lot, and I'm also a student of Carnatic music, at the music, the stream of Indian classical music. And I've been training for five years in the vocal aspect of it. And that's my Twitter handle should you wish to connect with me later. Um, so, before I start, how many of you have contributed to projects? Good. Um, so my topic today is all about the learnings that I have taken away from my contributions to open source. So as I suggested, or as I said in, in my talk description, my career is something that went through paths which I didn't even imagine about. Uh, just because I started contributing to open source, it can be really fun. So when I started on that journey, as I said, I didn't know that my career would go through paths, it would take me to places that I've never imagined. For example, I'm standing here speaking to you today. This is something that I never ever imagined doing when I started my journey as just a developer. So things that I speak here might not appeal to you, but nevertheless, my point is to get you thinking in the path of open source. Um, probably you can take away a point that open source is viable, it can be fun, and um, maybe get over that fear and confusion of your first open source contribution as well. Uh, I might suggest the name of the project that I contributed to during my journey with open source, but that's purely contextual. I'm not here to sign you up for contributing to this project. So when I heard the term open source all those years ago, I was like, open source what? What is it? And I was talking to my husband, we were newly married, He's also from the tech world, so he understands what I talk as well. So he was explaining to me how Firefox was open source. And I was like, what is open source? In simple terms, he said, that means the source code is available for you. He didn't understand. Okay, fine. That's out there. Perfect. I wasn't interested. I just locked that up away in one very inaccessible part of my brain and then forgot about it. A few years later, I shifted to UK after marriage, and then I started um, changing jobs. Um, and in at one point, in a digital agency that I was working, I came across Amraco. So this uh, this is a CMS, a content management system, which the agency was using uh, to build websites and web applications. And I had to pick that up as a part of my job. Fantastic. I came to know that Amraco is open source. I wasn't really keen, but I really liked the product because it was super friendly to use. I, I was having fun working with it, but it, it did not strike me as something that I should contribute to. I, I actually even forgot the whole aspect of open source around it. And then I became very busy embracing motherhood. And about 15 months of maternity leave later, I came back to kind of starting my job again. 15 months is a long, long time in tech. 
Uh, but Umbraco was quite a niche skill set that I had, and I started to focus more on Umbraco. And I started uh, going to meetups and conferences, and suddenly some of the people that I met online because I've been using their projects or plugins that they've written, they suddenly became people in real life to me. So I then came across this community around Umbraco. So the, more than often, every open source project that you find out there, there's usually a nice community of people out there. So people who are really passionate about the project, who think about contributions to the project, who make extensions of the projects, all sort of really, really nice people around, around that project. And that community actually inspired me and got me thinking that, hey, this is a really nice place to be in. There's a very passionate bunch of people around the project who really wishes to innovate the project in a certain direction. And I personally like the project. So why not um, step up and then start contributing? So it actually took me about uh, three or four years to make this decision that I want to contribute to open source. But even then, I was quite lost. I didn't know where to start. Uh, I just made the decision, I want to help out, I want to contribute, but I had no clue where to go, where to get started. Uh, luckily, I then managed to reach out to someone at Umbraco, someone who was working at Umbraco, because I was attending some training sessions with them. And uh, after an email trail, he kind of pulled together um, a list of tutorials and video tutorials and uh, the, the link to the GitHub project for me to get started on. All because I just walked up to him and said, hey, I want to start contributing, but I have absolutely no clue where to start. I was like, here you go, there's the code, get started. Good, I got something to get started on. I got the project up and run, running on my machine. And then came the big thing. Here's a list of issues. And that list of issues that was not even on GitHub at that point. It was something on, it was called CodePlex at that point, And all the issues were there. So suddenly I had a big list of issues sitting there smiling at me. And then he said, when you find the one you want to work on, just mark a comment saying that you're working on it so that no one else picks it up. Fine, that's fine. So I had this big list of issues smiling at me and I remember going through a lot of them, like clicking through them, trying to make sure that, do I understand this correctly or not? If so, if not, I just move on to the next issue. And a few hours of clicking later, I landed up on this. This was the issue that actually screamed at me saying that, yes, you can do it. And yes, of course, I marked a comment there saying, I'm gonna work on this. So basically, when you log into the back office of Umbraco, that is a content management system, you have a member section. And in there, there was a move button by the members. You should not be allowed to move a member that's just uh, that just doesn't make sense so okay I can do this let me go ahead and fix it and I did that that was my first pull request to an open source project and that description actually makes me cringe <laughs> please do not write something like that I'm going to forgive myself here because this was my first ever pull request to an open source project I was really excited and I, I was actually going back to that email, email trail I had with Rune and Strand at Umbraco HQ all those years ago. And it was pure nostalgia to the point I had to ping him on Slack saying, hey, do you know how far we've come across the line? So that was, that was a fun moment. That, that actually still brings a smile on my face when I think about that. Anyway, that was my first pull request in place. And I finally felt like a piece of the puzzle. Okay, I am fitting into the community now. And when Umbraco released the next version of the, pro the project, it had my work in, so I could proudly say, yes, do you know what? There was a move button in the member section. You won't see that now, because why? I went and fixed it. Whoopee, brilliant, work done. <laughs> it took me five years to go from being a user of Umbraco, something which I really, really liked, to the point of that first contribution. That's fine. Better late than never, that's what matters. And it's actually one of the most common journeys that someone takes while contributing to open source as well. 
they became they uh, people become the users of a project find that it's open source and then because of the passion they have for the project they start on contributing to the project that's one way of doing it second way would be you are looking for something which is a close match to your requirements you come across something and then you figure out hey it's close but not close enough so let me just go and make that extra fix to make it happen that's another way of contributing or you might be totally adventurous like i have seen people turning up at umbraco meetups and then doing their first umbraco uh, code contribution at their very first umbraco meetup that's also possible can be on the adventurous level as well all good but there are various different ways your first contribution can happen but i didn't want to stop here i was not happy with the fact that you know i i am at a standstill i want to do more i want to contribute more and that's when i learned that reviewing contributions like reviewing other other people's work can be an open source contribution as well there are multiple ways of contributing if someone tells you that code contributing is the only way no i have learned that apparently there are 25 different ways of contributing to open source i haven't listed out all the 25 i don't know whether if i've done all the 25 as well but there are that many ways of contributing uh, so reviewing contributions which is fantastic because if you look at an open source project it is on github the pull requests are out there you can go into one which actually intrigues you look at the code and see how they have worked it out this was a total game changer for me because um, from here I learned a lot of new things. I learned about coding styles and patterns, which of course I can uh, apply to my day to day job. I could see in real how others approach a problem and solve it, which is fantastic. I'm getting to know about different ways of dealing with things. Uh, I gained much more confidence around Git. Um, Umbraco was a project that I was using in my day-to-day -day job and all this reviewing contributions was outside my daily work. It was like voluntary work that I was doing, which I was still enjoying. But I then started to get a bird's eye view of the code, which means I got to know the inner workings of, inner workings of Umbraco itself, which actually then I could apply to my projects, which was again brilliant. And because I was going through the code more than often, I could uncover some of the hidden gems in the project and then teach my team uh, around it. So these are the technical things that I took away, but there was more than this. Reviewing contributions is a code review. So code review is like a gray area. You have to be really careful about what you tell the other person. And it is even more important when it comes to open source because it's all public. It's for anyone and everyone to see what you have. Uh, what you have told the other person. It's even more horrifying for the person at the receiving end, if you're someone like me, because to put your code out in public for someone like me, it was a, it was a mega step because there could be repercussions. I constantly had this feeling that, you know, I might be judged on the basis of that. So you have to be really careful about what you tell the other person. So you learn how to provide constructive effective and efficient feedback on work because what you might say might break the other person. The other person might be vulnerable, vulnerable, you never know. And all this conversation happens asynchronously over a GitHub conversation. You are not face to face as we are at the moment. So which is even more difficult because things get lost in translation when you write down. Moreover, you might be talking in English to someone who's language native language might not be english there's that issue as well so there's a lot of social skills that you pick up from open source contribution again which i have taken away and applied back to my work you need to know where to stop and how much to give the other person as well so that's incredibly important when it comes to working together in teams and as you work your way up as well especially when you get to managerial positions and so on but the biggest outcome of all this was I started contributing regularly to the code base that I wanted to because I was seeing other people and I, I was seeing how other people are working in contributions. So I, I managed to contribute towards API fixes. I managed to contribute 
on accessibility issues, I managed to contribute on the front end aspects of the CMS. Um, I was doing code improvements, even code comments. That was one area that I worked on. So your think of any potential way of improving your code that can be a code contribution. And slowly but st steadily be the imposter syndrome. So this is something that even the best in the business actually has to deal with. And it's a very, very nasty thing. It's that constant feeling uh, of what you have done to achieve the success is not legitimate and you constantly undervalue yourself. It's a very, very nasty thing. And if you let it take control over you, then it can be quite bad because it will beat your self-confidence and it will completely stop you from rising and shining. I still deal with it, but I think with constant practice and, you know, a help from the community that I've been dealing with, it's to a level that I can manage. But of course, it helps me. Uh, whatever I've done so far, it has definitely helped me kind of deal with the imposter syndrome. Now, if code contributions is not your thing or reviewing contributions is not your thing because you still need that technical knowledge to kind of provide that constructive feedback, you could help with documentation. Now, if you ask me, this is one of the most underrated forms of um, code contributions to open source because no one actually kind of understands or deal, uh, comes to the, comes to the real, realize the value of it till they actually deal with it. Uh, managing and maintaining documentation for a product is quite an art. So someone once told me that the minute you use the words just, simply, and easily in a sentence while you explain tech to someone, you are getting it all wrong. So <laughs> I try to avoid those words, but still there are places where I mess up. So whenever you uh, think about using those three words while explaining tech, uh, mark my words it might not convey as easily as it sounds to the other person. When, uh, one other thing is when you explain tech to someone else, um, I am pretty sure at least once you might have come across this person saying, can you just explain that to me once again in plain simple English? What does that mean? That is what a documentation should do. And what you can get by helping out with documentation is you learn to write documentation that caters to all levels of people from beginners to experts. And that's quite an art in itself. You have to write documentation in such a way that it gi gives the readers confidence and it gives the readers the sense of something that is achievable. So that again is quite an art in itself. Someone once told me that, you know, when you go and touch a new code base, um, the, and when you leave from that code base, leave it in the position better than when you found it. The same applies to documentation. You might be reading through a documentation. You might come across a typo. You can go ahead and fix it because you're making it better. That is where the value of the contribution lies. So this is all about writing up, but then there is more things that comes out of it. You acquire a deeper knowledge of a project when you start writing documentation. You know where to look for information because the other day I was working on something I knew I had read about this deep feature in Amrako somewhere. I knew exactly where to look for information. It could be documentation, it could be a forum post, but I know it exists and I was able to direct the team there, which was really helpful. And often what I found is that when I am kind of reviewing documentation, I sometimes go back to the code to verify, hey, is this actually the case? And then I go back, correct the documentation, but more than that, I sometimes find other things which I can make use of as well. And maybe that ends up in a code contribution. So there's so many ways it all kind of links together. It's, it's, a, it's a puzzle game in itself. And writing documentation has actually given me the confidence to create a blog post of my own and to write for online articles. I do have a personal blog which I maintain. I blog very occasionally, but the confidence that writing documentation gave me, I have been carrying that through to articles and blogs as well. That's a way of contributing. And of course, um, indirect more passive way of contributing is speaking at conferences and meetups. 
for example, today I'm talking to you that's indirectly uh, related to an open source contribution because I was here to talk about JSON or HTTP multiple days .NET at update conference. So there's, there's, a, there's life coming in a full circle. But what it helps me is it helped me create a brand and that brand is visible to people out there as well. So as I said, this might not be appealing to you. Many of the things that I've done might not be appealing to you, but these are choices that are out there for you if you want to do it. There are much more ways of contributing, like issue triage. You can test the software that you're working. You can raise a bug. And more than often, when you raise a bug, that developer's intrigue gets the best out of you, and then you start going into the code, and you will end up fixing that as well. More than often, that is the case. You could discuss new potential features, give that back to the, uh, the makers of the software, and help them out. You can mentor people. You can help others get started on the project of your choice. That's equally an open source contribution. You can start your own open source project as well. Like Conrad said, it's crazy, crazy ideas. It pays off. I have seen many people have built plugins of this project I'm working on, and then they learn, they give back to the community. More than often, I have seen them actually pulled back into the source code from Bradco because it's so good. Uh, to be in the course. So your things happen. You can start a meetup group, find speakers, and spread the word. That is also open source contribution. But at the end of it, you are always learning. I have learned a lot through this process. I can quite confidently say that my learning levels in the past seven years since I started contributing to open source has been a lot more than the previous seven years. So you're always learning and it's hands-on experience that you're getting as well. It's, it's very visible out there. Plus, I'm having a lot of fun learning and doing what I do as well. So um, I'm always enthusiastic now to learn more rather than, oh my God, I have to learn this. That, uh, I don't deal with that thing anymore. And I was lucky because the biggest career boost came in the form of these two awards for me, the Microsoft MVP for developer technologies, which I've been maintaining for the past two years. And I've been an Umbraco MVP for the past four years, all for the community. So these are things which I am proud of. Open source has given me all these to learn. That's quite a lot of takeaways from open source, things which I've learned, writing better code, addressing imposter syndrome, best practices, articles, accessibility, bug reports, speaking at events, which I'm doing now in-depth knowledge of the project, all which you can actually take away and use in your day-to-day -day job as well. It's given me things to brag about. I think it took me three years from 2017, my first contribution, to somewhere in 2020 where I was the top contributor to Umbraco and all the other open source repos connected to Umbraco. Uh, it came in the middle of lockdown, so it was something that cheered me up as well. And it has given me things to smile about because uh, this is a tweet which my friend Christmas Tamer put out saying that he found out a glitch, but the next time he visited, it was already fixed because I had already gone in and fixed it. So these are things which has given me reasons to smile. Um, and it has given me wonderful, wonderful friends in the community. Really, really good friends. Open source is not just about free software. It is a philosophy. It's a way of doing things. Because the way it works is you have a lot of people. You have this collective collaboration. People working together. That results in better innovation. That is the ideology behind it. So it's much more than here is a software that is free for you to learn. It's all about coming together of people. It's a way of doing thing, things. So. Friendships, um, these are things that I really cherish. All in all, what you get from open source contribution is verifiable and peer certified technical skills. You get verifiable communication skills. You get to be a part of a team and maybe take leadership of things, networking, and of course, the joy of seeing your work in action. I can totally brag, hey, that thing, I fixed it. So, if you have done any of the open source contributions, put it on your CV, have a GitHub repo, let your employer see that it's really useful. But all in all, enjoy the journey. Don't do open source contributions just for the take 
for the learning, for the awards that come out of it. Enjoy the journey, the takeaways or whatever I have achieved so far is just a perk. You need to really enjoy what you are doing for it to be successful. So enjoy that journey and you will be able to stand in the crowd. I hope I've got you thinking in the right direction with open source. That's it from me. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Purnima. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, presentation, and we're going to be ready for the next one. And this time, we're going to use this microphone, Kevin, uh, because apparently that doesn't silence, uh, and people might uh, online hear it much better. And it seems that, uh, at least from some of the 10 responses on the survey we got, which I was surprised that we got the survey uh, responses so quickly, uh, we have most of the online folks from Romania. So cheers to Romania. And before we continue and let Kevin go on, actually, yeah, we're presenting. So actually, just a reminder for people over here, people online, you can see it in the chat. Yeah. Uh, apparently, we are not doing the right thing right now. So share screen. Which one? left for a second and that's not sorry that <sighs> not take all right like where are you you said it's gonna be easy not your fault. <laughs> anyway, uh, I want to actually say one more thing. I definitely agree with what uh, Purnima said over here. Uh, when I talk with students uh, in some like you know discussions and that stuff, and if they ask like, "Hey, what should we do? How should we get good jobs and whatnot?" Uh, yeah, um, uh, the number one thing actually, I uh, I say like you know, contributions to open source are the biggest door opener for any company. Um, it doesn't have to mean that you have to do it. But like I have seen so many people who have interesting contributions to some um, to some projects, and that's like immediately you want to talk with them. Um, me as hiring for Microsoft, uh, you know, definitely do that. I have seen other companies do that quite often. So if you have time, if you're interested, it doesn't matter which project, it doesn't matter how deep you go. Uh, just like expressing that interest is definitely goes quite far. And just a reminder, people over here, please fill this survey. Uh, people online, you have it in the chat, uh, but please take a picture. Uh, after the talk, after you stop watching, uh, in average, it should take you two minutes and 45 seconds to fill it. So that's not that bad. Hopefully you can spare that time. And I'll stop bugging you and we're going to put uh, Kevin's slides on and Kevin is ready to go with his talk. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Goss, and uh, I will have the hard task of uh, speaking after all those inspiring speakers. Uh, but it's okay because I'm going to talk to you about failure. Uh, so one thing that I learned uh, the hard way uh, through my professional life is that uh, you're going to fail a lot. And uh, I would even say that failure is inevitable. And at some point you discover that it's almost as important to um, learn how to deal with failure rather than trying to, to prevent it in the first place. Um, I start by uh, introducing me quickly. Uh, so I'm a software engineer. I've uh, worked with uh, .NET technologies uh, for 15 years. I've been working at Datadog uh, since 2020, but before that I've worked at uh, Criteo for five years, and that will be the subject of the talk. 
And uh, before that, I had a phase uh, during eight years where I jumped from company for, to company when I, when I was getting bored. Um, so uh, let's talk about Criteo. Uh, can you lift your hand if you know what Criteo is? So uh, nobody, strictly nobody is lifting his hand. And yet I guarantee you that all of you know Criteo. Uh, Criteo does what is called ad retargeting. And so uh, let's say that you are uh, browsing online for a nice pair of sneakers. And uh, you, in the end, you don't buy it. Either it's not exactly what you're looking for, or maybe it's too expensive, and yeah. Maybe you, you even added, added it to the basket, but you didn't proceed to check out. And then later during the day, or even the days after, uh, you browse the news on CNN, and you see an ad with uh, those sneakers. And so this is what we call ad retargeting. And uh, the theory behind it is that uh, we know that you are interesting, interested in uh, buying this, and uh, by showing you suggestion and making you keep thinking about it, uh, we are trying to uh, give you that little push so that finally you, you buy it. And so uh, there are many companies that does uh, ad retargeting. Uh, Google is the main one, but uh, Criteo is one of the biggest actors in the market. So whenever you see one of those ads, there is a large chance that it comes from Criteo. And so, um, to, uh, just to show quickly how it works, uh, basically uh, when you browse a website, a retailer website, for each action that you, that you take, uh, when you click somewhere, when you add a product to the basket, uh, it's going to send an event uh, to Criteo. Uh, they are building uh, your anonymized profile and then they are feeding it to machine learning models. And then when you uh, browse, for instance, a new website or uh, anything that display ads, uh, is going to call an ad exchange, so a kind of marketplace for ads, and it's going to call all the ad providers and ask them if they are willing to pay to show you an ad. And so uh, every provider will reply with how much they are willing to pay to show you an ad, and the highest bidder uh, wins uh, the right to uh, display uh, the ad to you. And so uh, a large part of the business model is trying to figure figure out the right price to pay uh, to have the right to show you an ad depending on how likely you are to click on it. So uh, now that, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot. Uh, a lot of studies have shown that uh, the faster, the, uh, the quicker an ad is displayed and the more likely you are to click on it. So everything is happening very quickly. And for instance, uh, the ad auction uh, just lasts 100 milliseconds. And so, now that I explain uh, what is it, uh, let's try to guess at what scale uh, Criteo is operating. Uh, it's a bit hard to throw numbers when uh, you have uh, no, uh, no comparison. So uh, first, let's talk about some uh, mainstream uh, websites. So for instance, uh, Stack Overflow, the website that saved uh, Conrad, uh, handled uh, 200 million requests per day. Then uh, Wikipedia, that everybody knows about, uh, shows uh, 1 billion page view per day. So uh, note that I'm comparing different metrics here, uh, request versus page view. Whenever you display a page, it's going to uh, make many requests. And so in the end, I think uh, Wikipedia, it's about 10 billion requests per day. And then Google, the gateway to internet, has uh, 8.5 billion searches per day. Once again, when you make a search, it's going to trigger a bunch of uh, HTTP requests. And so now that you have those figures, uh, does anybody want to try uh, to guess how many requests does Criteo process per day? So a number, any number? Yeah, not bad. Uh, so Criteo in 2019, um, so yeah, everything I'm, I'm telling is before 2020 bef because I left the company and so I don't know how they are doing today. And so in 2019, that was 300 billion HTTP requests per day on average. And there are a uh, time in the year where uh, the traffic is even higher, for instance, around Black Friday because everybody is doing online shopping. And during Black Friday 2018, uh, they, oh yeah, sorry. 
I'm getting ahead of myself. So 200 billion HTTP requests per day, that's one stack overflow per minute. Uh, and so during Black Friday 2018, they reach uh, 1,000 billion uh, requests, so 1 trillion requests uh, in a single day. So this is absolutely massive scale. Uh, to handle that, they have more than 14,000 servers. And I'm only talking about front-end servers, then there are as many servers uh, doing the machine learning offline and 3.3 uh, million lines of C-sharp code. Uh, and so uh, when you are working at this kind of scale, uh, probabilities take a different meaning uh, because uh, if you are writing your own application and you have a bug that happens uh, once in a billion time, you are not going to try to fix it because it will probably never happen. And even if it does, you're just going to restart the application and stop thinking about it. Uh, but here, once in a billion, that's 300 times per day. So uh, you just can't uh, ignore it. And that's why uh, failure becomes a, a daily event because every small random condition on your, in your bug is absolutely guaranteed to happen at some point. And so I've gathered a few stories from my, uh, from my work experience about how things uh, went terribly wrong. Um, and the first one is about caching. So um, if you remember the, sh the small ad I shown you, uh, we were seeing multiple products and their price. And all this data is stored in a SQL Server database. And a SQL Server is nice, but there is no way that it can handle this kind of load. And so there is a periodic job that uh, takes this data and push it to Coachbase. Uh, Coachbase is a NoSQL database, uh, which is much faster than SQL Server. And uh, whenever uh, a request comes from internet to the Critio server, uh, when it tries to construct the ad, it will interrogate uh, a memcache server. So memcache is an in-memory storage, uh, which is blazingly fast and uh, get the data from it. And for each entry, uh, you have the data itself and you have some metadata which uh, contains, among other things, the time at which it was generated. Uh, and then it's going to reply to the client. And finally, if the key was missing from MCache or if uh, the timestamp was too old, it's going to uh, query Coachbase to get uh, the fresh version of the data and push it to MemCache. And you may notice something odd. Uh, the server is first replying to the client and only after is getting fresh data. And that's because Coachbase is too slow for the, for the usage. And so uh, if the server uh, tried to uh, query uh, Coachbase live, then it would reply too late to the client. That's why it's trying its best using the outdated data. And then uh, asynchronously, it tried to refresh it so that the next time it needs it, need it, it can use the fresh version. Uh, anyway, uh, the problem uh, started when we discovered that uh, server were using uh, stale uh, data. So we noticed it from business metrics. We noticed that in some ads, we were showing prices that were outdated. So of course, we started by checking uh, the storage. Everything in SQL Server and Coachbase was uh, up to date. Uh, so then we turn to uh, Memcache and uh, we check uh, the timestamp of the key to see if there were some keys that weren't updated recently, but all the timestamp where well, we found no timestamp that were far in the past. But after closer inspection, we noticed something very weird is that uh, the expiration date of some, some entries were set months in the future, which shouldn't be possible because when you refresh the data, you set the current timestamp. So uh, we try to understand where it was coming from. And uh, we eventually, we figured out that all the future cache entries uh, had been set by the same server. So at least we, we knew where to, where to focus. And uh, the first thing we, we checked was the date and time of the server because uh, for the entry to be in the future, uh, the date on the server would have to be wrong. But it was correct, so we checked uh, in the end the Windows event log. So I don't know if you've ever used it, but on Windows you have this centralized log where uh, every significant action is logged. And so later you can figure out what happened on your computer. 
and we found uh, this entry. So not exactly this one. This is a screenshot that I found on the internet. This was the same thing. Uh, just an entry that says that the system time has been changed. And so uh, what happens is uh, in many companies, and especially if you have a distributed architecture, it's very important that the time on all your server is the same because many protocols rely on the current time. And so uh, the time on the server is synchronized every minute using uh, the Windows time service, which relies on the NTP protocol, which is a protocol that is commonly used for that. And so what this event log entry was telling us was that uh, the faulty server received at some point an NTP packet that told us to set is that a few months in the future. And then since it's synchronized uh, every minute, the next minute it receives uh, the, the right date. And so uh, it set its clock back to normal. But the problem is that during that minute, every time the server would query an entry from the cache, it will think that it has expired since the uh, server was leaving months in the future. So it would refresh it, but when refreshing the cache, it will store a timestamp that is months in the future, and so then the entry will never expire. And that's how we, we ended up in this situation. And the thing is, um, yeah, that's what I said. And the thing is, to this day, uh, we don't fully understand why it happened, uh, but uh, while trying to understand, I um, I tried to recreate the NTP packet that the computer should have received at that moment. And so basically, inside of an NTP packet, the date is encoded on 64 bit. And so I constructed the timestamp that the uh, computer should have received. And I constructed the one from the date that was uh, actually set. And I noticed that there were only uh, two bits of difference. So two bits out of 64 is very small. And so the leading theory is that uh, we had some kind of uh, bit flip. And so uh, this is actually a, a subject that is uh, studied very closely uh, in critical hardware, for instance, a medical hardware or uh, stuff that go into space, because uh, many outside sources such as cosmic ray can cause bits to flip uh, inside of your computer. Uh, it's supposed to be exceedingly rare, uh, especially here, you will need, uh, so uh, there would have been two bits that were flipped. And uh, it's even more improbable because uh, in your network protocol, you have some error correction uh, mechanism. And so basically your message has a signature that allows you to verify if there was any error in the message. And so um, this will need to flip bits and then uh, to flip bits in such a way that it generates the same signature as the intended message, uh, which uh, has an incredibly low probability of happening. And yet it happened. Uh, and so, yeah, to, to, to try to prevent that in the future, uh, we added the logic in the servers to ignore any, any timestamp that is far in the future. But it really shows that no matter what you do, uh, at some time, sometime, things are just bound to fail. Um, another failure, so this time it's not really about probability, but an adverse effect of working at scale, uh, which is something that is called a, a threshold effect. Uh, so basically, um, this, this happened, so it was somewhere before, uh, before Black Friday, sorry. Uh, we introduced a bug uh, in the code without knowing it that would only manifest when the traffic of the server is above a threshold. So let's say 1,000 requests per second. When the traffic got around that, then uh, the server had a very small probability of crashing. And uh, the more you increase the traffic and the higher that probability was. And so uh, this is a very... Uh, sneaky way uh, of crashing because normally if you have a problem, you see a few server crashing in your data center and then you investigate and uh, you fix the problem before uh, it spreads. But here, the, the, the way it happens, uh, so uh, as the traffic increase at some point, it reaches the threshold and so you have one server that crashes. All right, bad luck. 
uh, no problem, the load balancer is detected and spread the traffic on the other servers. But uh, because of that, now the other servers are taking a tiny bit more traffic, so they are a tiny bit more likely to fail. So another server is failing, no problem. The load balancer remove it and spread the traffic to the other servers. Now the other server is taking a significant amount of traffic and so they have a large chance of crashing. So now a bunch of servers are crashing. So the load balancer take them out. And uh, just like that, uh, you lose all the servers in the data center in a few minutes before you can even realize uh, what was happening. And so this happened to us. Um, and uh, after this happened, we uh, learned another problem that we didn't anticipate is that so all your servers crashed, so uh, you roll back the software, uh, you fix the bug and so on, and then comes the moment to restart your, your data center, which is something you normally never do. And the problem is that uh, when, a, so you are going to start all your server at once, but there is one server that is going to go online before the others. And as soon as it comes online, the load balancer sees the server and send all the traffic from the data center to that single server. And so you can be sure that this server is going to immediately crash. And then the next one that starts receives all the traffic, so it's going to crash and so on. And so uh, we had to update the logic of the load balancer so that whenever a new server comes online, uh, it will uh, just send a tiny bit of traffic until enough uh, servers were online to, to handle the load. And this is the kind of stuff that is almost obvious in hindsight, but uh, you have to experiment them once to, to think about it. Uh, another event that happened to us, so as I said, uh, Criteo needs to uh, display the ad as fast as possible. And so to make things uh, faster, uh, they have uh, data centers uh, all around the world uh, so that uh, no matter where you are, you have a data center close to you to send you the, the request. And this particular problem happened to the data center in Japan. So Criteo does not have any technical team in Japan. So this data center is entirely administrate, administrated remotely. And so uh, there is a private network and there are three dedicated network links that connect uh, the Criteo headquarters to that data center. And uh, it's only for redundancy. One network link is fast enough for all the, the purpose. So there, there are three network links only in case one of them fails. And in the unlikely event that uh, everything would go wrong, there is also a VPN access through internet, but nobody uses it because it's kind of slow. And if everybody else fails, you can still fly uh, to Japan and administrate the server there. And so uh, it was around the end of 2018, and uh, two network links were in maintenance. It, basically, the two providers decided to do their maintenance at the same time. That's unlucky, but it's okay. It's okay, it happens, and one, net, one link is enough. And so uh, what could possibly go wrong? Well, uh, at the end of 2018, uh, Typhoon JB hit Japan, uh, which is, according to the news, uh, the worst uh, typhoon in uh, 25 years. And so uh, because of that, uh, there was an outage at the remaining uh, network provider and their link uh, went down. So no problem, we can still administrate the servers through internet, except that, as I said, uh, this link is kind of slow, so nobody's using it. And so we discovered that it was badly configured and so it actually never worked. All right, uh, you can still fly there, except that there is a typhoon, so all the planes are grounded. And so we ended, ended up in that situation where we couldn't communicate with our data center. And uh, if we uh, browse, uh, yeah, so the server kept working, and if we browse uh, Japanese websites, we would see our ads. So the, the server was still working. And that may sound like a good thing, but this is actually a terrible thing, because uh, I explained to you that um, 
it goes through an ad auction to uh, decide how much we are willing to pay to show you an ad. And uh, it means that servers are automatically spending money. And so that's something that we want to uh, closely monitor because uh, if there are any problem in the algorithm, and it already happened, uh, the servers may start uh, bidding incredible amount, and that's money that Crito will directly lose. And so uh, this was a very stressful situation uh, since we had no way to verify how much the servers were spending without us uh, checking on them. Uh, and I, I would like to uh, tell you that we found an ingenious way to uh, connect to the data center, but no. We even try hacking into our own server, but we fail because uh, Criteo takes security very seriously. And so they pay an external security company every year to do some pen testing and uh, fix any security flow that we might have. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's how it, hand, it ended. So uh, for a few days, we were unable to connect to the data center. And finally, we managed to get somebody there. Uh, actually, he didn't fly directly to Japan. He fly to Hong Kong, and then he took a boat to Japan because the airport was still uh, closed. So, uh, yeah. And uh, the last story to, to wrap it up. Uh, so basically, on all of our servers, we have an administration page, which is uh, reachable only through the, the private network, you know, the, the one that were cut. Um, and it allows us to uh, do some command maintenance tasks. So it looks like this, basically just an HTML page with a few links to different actions. For instance, uh, checking the status of the cache, checking the log, capturing a memory dump. Uh, offline is to uh, put a server offline. So basically it tells the load, uh, the load balancer to stop sending traffic to that server. This way, you can do stuff on that server, such as restarting the application or whatever, without impacting the outside traffic. And then you have online to take it back online. All right. And uh, we have an outage uh, where uh, all the servers in a given data center uh, became unavailable uh, during a few minutes. And uh, after inspecting the log, we discovered that for every server, uh, they captured a memory dump, so triggered by the administration page. Uh, to capture a memory dump, so basically a memory dump is uh, just a copy of the content of the memory. Uh, we do that for debugging purpose because then we can uh, analyze it offline. Uh, but to do that, uh, you need to freeze the application while uh, copying the memory. And uh, because they use, uh, they use a huge amount of memory, it can take many minutes to, to complete. And so uh, we ask around for who uh, decided to capture memory dump from all the servers. Uh, everybody said, no, it's not me. And anyway, it happened during the night. So uh, I don't know who would wake up to just to do that. Uh, but uh, by looking at the logs, we discovered some errors that were caused by the vulnerability scanner. So basically, the, the security team had a scanner which uh, would scan pages and try to call them with various arguments to try to detect security flow. And this caused logs uh, in the error. This is, uh, this is totally expected. But then we thought, uh, is there a chance that something in this scanner triggered uh, the memory dump? And so uh, we, uh, we asked around and the security team said, no, no, that's not us because our scanner used a whitelist and uh, the main administration page is in the whitelist. So the scanner is going to scan it, but it won't scan, for instance, the memory dump page because it is not in the whitelist. Uh, but I think us, we kept uh, gathering evidence that uh, maybe, uh, maybe the security team wasn't innocent. Uh, for instance, the outage happened exactly at the same time when the security scanner was uh, triggered. Uh, in the logs, it was the IP of the server from the security team. So at some point, uh, we had them reconsider. And so uh, they discovered something that they didn't know, is uh, their security scanner knew how to parse, parse HTML and follow links. 
Uh, and so uh, if you remember, the administration page has links to all the action. And so uh, the security scanner just parse each link and then call it. And even though we had an outage of a few minutes during which uh, the memory dump was, was called, we realized that it could have been much worse because uh, the actions are sorted uh, alphabetically and by chance in the English language, offline come before online. And so the scanners can offline, took the server offline and immediately scan online and took it back online. But if it was the other way, we would have lost uh, the whole data center. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I don't have a conclusion uh, because I failed to come with one. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the talk and uh, in your uh, future work experience, uh, just remember that uh, it's expected that things will go bad and, and that's okay. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Kevin. It was, uh, at least for me, very entertaining. Uh, and uh, uh, with that, we're going to conclude. Uh, I'm going to put the slide with the link again. Uh, guess why? Because I want to get at least some participation. So far in other meetups, I failed to get too many responses. So I hope that with students, it's going to be easier because you're used to do your homework, right? You do it on time, right? Right? Anyway, please uh, just put it up, man. Put it up. Oh, it's up. Fine. There we go. Anyway, so if you can please fill the survey, it's going to help us to find out which talks you like, how much it's going to help the speakers to think about how they should talk with students next time. It's going to help us to find out what kind of speakers we can find for you next time. Um, if you like the stories, motivation and open source, uh, experience from past or how to find your ways, whatever it is. So. Uh, please do that, and I hope that you enjoyed the evening, uh, either from recording. By the way, if you're watching the recording, uh, please fill the survey as well. You got this far, at least. Uh, so, thank you very much, and um, enjoy. Bye. Okay, so uh, thank you all of here and all of the watching, and that's all. So hopefully see you next time.